A different perspective on women in the world now. Studies have shown that companies with women in senior leadership roles are more profitable. Put another way, there's a real cost to gender discrimination. Girls 20 is a Canadian global organization designed to cultivate female leaders through education and entrepreneurial training and international experiences. Young delegates from the G20 countries and a handful of others meet each year for their own Girls Summit and then present a communique to the G20 political leaders about how to increase female participation in the labor force. Farah Mohammed is the founder of Girls 20 and she is also soon to take on a new role as CEO of the Malala Fund. We met in Toronto. What is it that you hope your delegates to Girls 20 come away with? What are you trying to instill in them? Well, the first thing I'll say is we put together a delegation that is so diverse in nature. And so the first thing I want them to come away with is an incredible international network. We know that networks matter. These girls are going to come. They're what we would call diamonds in the rough. So they come, and I want them to leave with new skills, new relationships, and a new perspective that they can actually influence change. So new skills, what kind of skills are you trying to imbue in them? Yeah, we, we live in an interesting world now. Right? We learn a lot of stuff in school, and a lot of what we learn um, is important, but we need to supplement that. So through Girls 20 and our partners, uh, the girls learn how to do media skills, communications, how do you interview. They learn how to put together a business plan. They learn how to run their own social profit. Uh, we have organizations like Norton Rose Fulbright. They actually come and put all the girls through Myers-Briggs training. So imagine you're 18 to 23 years of age, and you know what your leadership capacity is. That's incredible. So the skills that they learn are everything from, we've got a new one this year. This woman's coming and teaching them, how do you maintain your curiosity, your creativity, using Lego? When did we last talk about playing with Lego? We were four, five, nine years old. So we try to mix things up so the girls can actually see from their own perspective when they go back home, the skills that they have and how they can be applied. You've been doing it for a few years now. So when they go home, what evidence have you seen? What changes do you think these young women are making? Alison, I have to tell you, this is my favorite question. <laughs> so it's not good enough for me for the girls to come together, make some new friends, walk away from skills. That's what I would call a kumbaya approach. For Girls 20, what we do is, because we give them the skills and the network, we say to them, and they have to sign a document that makes a commitment before they are accepted as a delegate, that says, I will go back home and I will launch a social profit venture or another initiative or work with a partner to ensure that other girls and women are empowered. Now, that has meant starting computer labs. That has meant giving out sanitary napkins to girls in rural communities. It has meant getting a bus, ripping up the seats, putting books in, going to the slums of Indonesia. It has meant looking at curriculum. So these girls choose what they are passionate about. They choose their partners. They've come up with the idea. They pitch that idea to one of our global advisors. They get advice back, and then they execute. And for us, that's the game changer. It shows them that they can actually do what they set out to do. They can make a difference. But most importantly, they are held to account for the commitment they make. So if I was a boy in Afghanistan, let's say, or any other one of those countries where those girls are making a difference, I'd want that chance too. Why do you think it's more important to imbue girls with that? You know, I get that question almost ever after every summit. I get the, where's the B20? And the, where's the boys 20? And I always say, there is, in fact, a boys 20. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, I think it's important um, to ensure that these girls have opportunities because the scale is not equal. Girls in certain countries don't start off with the same opportunity. They have either cultural challenges. They have challenges around getting quality, safe education. So a girl actually walking to school can be dangerous. Like, so you can't, like Malala. for example, like yeah. Malala. But so you can't actually um, compare boys to girls in many different countries. Canada is an amazing place to go to school, but we still worry about our safety in some communities. So if you think about safety as one of the areas that you have to actually address, and then you look at education, how does it stem from there? Then think about how girls learn versus how boys learn. The tools. What are we doing about an unconscious bias? Why are we ensuring that some boys go after engineering? that girls go after arts. So we do need to make sure that we're creating opportunities that are special for girls. And I don't mean special in terms of you don't empower a girl by disempowering a boy, but you have to make sure that the opportunities are the same, that they can compete, that they can pursue their passion, not what we think they should be passionate about, but what they are passionate about. Because think about your own life. 
Think about your career. You made those decisions. You were empowered. You got the education, but you got the opportunity. And that, I think, is the key. That's the game changer for Girls 20. Is there greater leverage within a community if girls are leaders? 100%. So we know that um, in communities where girls and women are engaged, whether it's from an economic, a political point of view, as we're seeing more and more now, that community is stronger. So we know that decisions are being made for a vast majority of people. I'm going to give you a really great example. Mm. So early child marriage, huge issue. 10 million girls get married every year. If we don't, in fact, change that, we can't afford to lose those girls to the economy, to strong communities. So there are organizations that actually work in the communities with men and boys, with mothers, to say, let us tell you the advantage of your girls not getting married at the age of 15 or 14. The economic advantage. The economic advantage, the societal advantage, uh, you know, making sure that her health is good. Mm -hmm. We've seen the stats. What you have to do is look beyond the stats. You have to look at the actual communities that are stronger because girls have been a part of it. What difference do you think they've made to the political G20 leadership, because that's that's sort of the end piece of it, right? That, that it's around the, the G20, the most powerful nations in the world. Yeah. You know, when we started, so seven years ago, no one was talking about the economic empowerment of girls and women as a uh, factor on GDP. We talked about how do we get the GDP go up. We all talked about different sectors. We didn't necessarily talk about people. So when we came to see, and it was a hard battle, try to convince the G20 to actually put female labor force participation on their agenda and then make a commitment. So the first thing I would say is in 2014, the G20 committed to creating 100 million new jobs for women by 2025. And so now ourselves, other organizations, have banded together and said, here is the advice that we think you should take. So I'll give you a very concrete example. The delegates last year said, if you want to make sure more women are working, then why don't you procure from government contracts from women who are uh, owning businesses by 50% or they are uh, controlling businesses 50% of? We're seeing actual governments like our own say, okay, in terms of procurement, X percentage has to be from female-led and female-owned companies. And is that actually happening in Canada? In Canada, that started. So I know from meeting with the Prime Minister's office that they are actually looking at that very seriously. That's a Treasury Board change. That's a finance change. That's going to change the way that this government procures goods and services. That means more women will be working. Look at another example. Uh, there are organizations like Shopify. Okay, mm -hmm. Shopify is Canadian-based. It has blown up the market for women to be part of this idea of we will make something and be able to sell it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those things actually do make a difference. If you think about the number of women who work from home, right? they're entrepreneurs. We've never seen them in that light before. So I think the world is changing. The G20 is seeing women as a force of real economic prowess versus it's the right thing to do, which is what we used to always say. Uh, Prime Minister Abe has been very clear. He has said Japan can't make it back without women at the center of it. So we are looking at, I think, a very big change with the G20 in terms of the policies that they take, uh, the manner in which they actually go after um, expenditures. We want to see more. I, I have to be honest, I have not seen across the board um, a very clear picture of what they've done since 2014 to say, here's where we've created the jobs, here's right. how many jobs we've created, and here's what's in the pipeline. You need to see the evidence We want to see the evidence now. Yeah. Right? It's been three years, this will be our fourth year. Uh, we've had great conversations with different governments, uh, but now it's time. We've had time to put your plans together. It's time to execute those plans because we know that economies just can't grow when not everyone's a part of it. It's just impossible to think that the GDP will go up if women in, are not a contributing factor. Let's check in again after that G20 in July. Would love to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.